start with the first technical one. So we have Ashutosh here, who is going to take you through the Coda Bootcamp. Uh, Ashutosh, good morning. Good morning, Naveen. Day two. How are you feeling? Yeah, I'm feeling very good. And I can see a smile on your face because even you were waiting for the code part, right? Yeah. Really. You know, developers don't like PPTs. <laughs> we, we love to code. Yeah. Awesome. Yesterday was more like slides and all. I mean, it's boring, right? So we love yeah. to code. That's what we'll be doing today. Yeah, I know. And you know, uh, Ashutosh, I know you love to code, but maybe in between, I will jump jump into your session to take a small quiz for $150. Yeah. We love code and we love money as well. <laughs> oh, that's okay. awesome. Don't block me there, okay, Ashutosh, once I get into your uh, session. Definitely, definitely. Uh, thank you, Ashutosh, all yours. All right. Uh, thanks, Naveen. Um, so, uh, like Naveen said, I mean, uh, you would have already got an idea that uh, day, th today it's it's more like we're just doing coding, right? So no more slides from my side. We'll just directly jump into code. But before that, I'll just introduce my co-host who is uh, Peter. And he'll be there in the chat to help you guys with uh, any kind of questions. So over to you, Peter, how are you doing this? Hello, everybody. It's Peter Lee again. So uh, today is going to be an exciting day of uh, coding. Remember uh, yesterday, um, towards the end, I announced the code challenge, and today will be your opportunity to learn about uh, both Corda and Conclave. Uh, so I will be in the chat for this session. So if you have any questions, uh, just drop in the chat. Back to you, Ashna. Thank you so much, Peter. Well, yeah, um, so that's Peter. He'll be helping our guys with any kind of questions that you can put on the chat. There's also a Q&A, I guess. And if you want to uh, put any questions over there, that's also open. And um, with that, let me just share my screen and we can get started. All right. So like I promised, um, we are not doing any slides. I'll directly jump onto the code here. And uh, what we'll be developing is a very simple application. Um, this probably, if you're really new to Coda, this will be your first step towards building an application and you will learn how to build all these different components of Coda that we talked about yesterday, like the states, contracts, and the flows. And if you're not there yesterday, the recording is also available. And I'll also go through some of these concepts as I code. Um, obviously, not in as much details as we did yesterday, but that should give you an idea of what we're really doing. Right? All right. So let's move on and try and understand what exactly are we seeing here. So over here, you see the project. Um, and what you would see is we have certain files here. So like you would, the names would uh, somewhat be familiar to you, like states, contracts, and then we have flows. We talked about uh, flows being divided into two parts, right? Um, the initiator flow and the responder flow. So that's where you see two different flows as well. And we have some test classes uh, to test our code. So as we write our code, we'll use these test classes to basically test out what we have done. Um, so the way we are doing is it's a TDD approach or test driven development approach. So if you see, uh, we have these test cases here and what we'll do is we'll write corresponding code for this test case and make sure that the test cases pass so that by the end of uh, this entire exercise, once we have done with uh, the entire, um, uh, the entire example code here, we should get all the test cases passed and we should have a entire uh, application working or the code app working. And finally, we'll go around deploying this to a demo network and we'll see how Coda really works uh, in, in practice. Right. So let's start with our first one, which is the state. Like I said, we're developing a very simple application called as the token application. This is more like deploy, creating a token and then uh, sharing it with, uh, uh, with someone, right? So there will be an issuer who would be issuing certain tokens to a particular holder. We don't have a transfer function here in this, but if you really want to develop, it's up to you. So I'll just uh, I'll just concentrate on the issue here. So once we are done with the issue, uh, which will be done, uh, which will be uh, done today, you can always go back home and try try out the transfer function, which should be pretty similar to how you're doing the issue. Once you have an exam, once you have an idea of how uh, this particular thing should work, the the transfer should also be easier to uh, follow after that. So yeah, um, concentrating on states here. What exactly is a state? Like we talked about, a state is basically your asset, right? So whatever you want to put on the ledger or you represent on the ledger is your state. So what are the what are the different properties that you might want on a token? 
let's think about uh, very simple ones. We don't want to make it really uh, uh, complicated. So let's put bare minimum thing so that it becomes easier for us to develop it. So let's say what, 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 so we need an issuer, right? So that's pretty simple. Someone needs to issue this token. So if you try and understand the issuer is an identity on the node, right? So this is some person who would be issuing this token. So, or some node who would be issuing this token. Now, how do you represent an identity on the, uh, on, on the code? That's by using a Coda kind of uh, API called the party, which is a class which you really use to represent uh, identity. So we use the party class and uh, we, we name it as issuer. So the next thing is obviously once we have an issuer, we also need an owner, the one who would holding who would be holding this token, right? So let's say another party, obviously it's an identity. So owner is that that's the two guys, right? We have an issuer, we have an owner. And what else do we want in a token? Well, obviously we don't want someone to hold a token, which is zero in amount. So we need an amount to represent how much token someone holds. So that would be an integer and we can name it as amount. So this would represent how many tokens or how much token someone really holds. Right, so that's pretty much on the properties part. Let's keep it as simple as possible. Let's not clutter it with too many properties. So there's our very first code app and we need a constructor obviously to create an instance of this. So that's done. And we need certain getters just like that. Um, so uh, we do not need setters, like uh, you know, anything that's put in the Coda ledger is going to be immutable. So once you are going to create this, you're not really going to update it. So we don't, no point of putting setters. And finally, how does Coda know that this actually is a token? And this actually is a state, right? So for that, we'll have to implement a particular class called as the contract state. As I do this, it asks me to implement a method called get participants. What does this do? It is all about uh, Coda knowing who should know about this particular state. So once you create an instance of this particular state, how does Coda know who should know about it? Remember the privacy model, not everyone knows about a particular uh, state. So this is how Coda knows who should know about it. So you pass a list of participants who should know about this particular instance. So who are they? For me, it should be the issuer and the owner. So these two guys should know about any uh, existence of a particular instance of the token state. So that's pretty much it. Pretty simple, right? Nothing complicated. Just put certain properties and a constructor, few getters, and then a simple method to, to tell Coda that these are the guys who should know about this particular asset that I'm trying to create. All right, so let's just test it out and see if everything is fine. I'll just take everything out, uncomment all of them, and run the test. Uh, hopefully, this should pass. Perfect. So we get all the test cases passed. That means that uh, we have our state completed, and we are ready to move on to the next level. So next part is to de uh, develop our contract, right? So we have a state, the asset is done. Now we want business rules. So we want to uh, write rules, which would basically govern all the uh, evolution of our asset that we're creating. So in terms of evolution, we're not doing much here. We're just doing issue. We want to write down rules that would govern issuance of an asset. So what are the different rules that you would look at? But before that, uh, let's uh, put or let Coda know that we are trying to de develop a contract. So just implement the contract interface and that should do it. And as I do it, uh, you could see that I have a commented line of code here, which I'm going to uncomment just to let Coda know that, well, this token state is governed by a particular contract, which is called as token contract, which I'm just going to develop now. All right. So like we said, um, well, the contract is all about uh, writing rules, which would um, govern the evolution of your assets. So all the rules can be written within the verify method. Uh, so this, this verify method comes from the contract interface. So as you write the contract interface or implement the contract interface, it would require you to uh, write this verify method. So that's what I'll be doing. And as you can see, this verify method is actually getting a ledger transaction object as a parameter, which is really convenient because it gives you access to everything that a transaction has. So um, what do I really want to test? 
or check in my in my rules. So I'll keep it simple. I'm not going to real business rules. I'll just keep it uh, uh, like certain kind of validations, and you can write your own business rules as you dip, as you develop your real applications. Okay, so first uh, validation that probably I want to do is since I'm doing an issuance, uh, remember uh, that issuance should not have any input because obviously you're issuing it for the very first time. There's nothing to consume in the ledger. So let's make sure that we're not consuming anything accidentally while we're trying to issue this particular asset. So say get input. So if you look at get inputs, this is a list. So I can say if size is not equal to zero, that means there is something in the input which is wrong. So I'll just throw an exception. So every time you want to, uh, um, you want Coda to know that there is something wrong going on with the business validations, you just throw an exception, which is the illegal argument exception and the platform will catch it and throw the appropriate uh, error with a message that you really put in here. So the message for me would be zero inputs, expected and that should do for the first validation let's look at some other validations that we want, might want um, so that would be let's look at the outputs as well how many outputs do we have so we're trying to issue a particular token that means we should have exactly one output and if it's not the case that means that uh, there is something which is getting reduced while we are trying to produce a token which is wrong we should not we should only get the token not something else right so there should be only one output one output expected that should do it uh, finally also checking on the um, command that we have remember remember about commands that these are the intent of the transaction we should not have multiple commands for this case we are just trying to do an issue so just checking that as well to make sure there is just one command quick and simple that's it so done uh, with checking uh, about the shape of the transaction how does it how many different uh, number of inputs outputs and commands are there now let's look at uh, some of the content and try and understand what exactly are these things that we uh, that we are trying to validate and we know that there is one output but what exactly is it is it a token or is it a vehicle is it a house so let's just check that right transaction dot get output if you look at this particular method which has an index which it takes we already know that there is one output so i can directly use that without worrying about null pointers and to make sure it's an instance of token state and if it's not that means there is something fishy going on but i'm trying to uh, create our output and token state well i'm not getting a token state in the output which means there's something wrong I will just throw an exception saying token state expected. Right, um, so let's check our command as well. Is it really issue? We have one command that we really know, but what exactly is the command? So again, using the um, method with, which takes a parameter uh, or the index, which is zero. Now this will require, remember the command has two different things. One is the command itself or the type of the command, what exactly is the command, which you get with the value. And the other is it accompanies a list of signers who should sign the transaction for this particular command. So not worried about the signers now. So I'm just uh, uh, looking at the type of command we have, so which we can get by get value. And the command should actually be issue, which is, if you can see is defined here. Right, and if it's not issue, that means this is not what I want. I need to throw an exception if something is not right. So I'll do that, say issue command expected. And finally, um, we have a token and we don't want a token to be issued, which has like something like negative amount or zero amount. That is something we don't want, right? What would a token with a negative amount represent or a token with zero amount represent? It's it's absolutely useless. Why do you issue something around of that type? So we'll make sure that we have a token which has a positive amount, right? So let's do that. Um, I will get hold of the output. 
right? And if you really want to inspect what we are actually getting out of this output, it ex it's, it's actually a contract state, not a token state. So I cannot really access the, the amount field unless I really go ahead and typecast this. So let me do that. Perfect. So now I, I have a, a, um, a token state which will allow me to access the amount, right? I need, just need to make sure that it's positive. And if it's not positive, I just throw an error. It should do it. If it's not positive, I'll just throw an error, saying illegal argument exception, say positive amount expected. All right, um, so simple till now. There's one more uh, check that we want to do. We have checked about uh, the, the shape of the transaction, check the content of the transaction. Let's make sure that uh, we have the correct signers. So to do that, uh, so this is an issuance case. I just want the issuer to sign for this transaction to be successful. But let's, let's just make sure that the issuer is marked as a required signer. So how do we do that? Um, the signers are available in the commands like we have already discussed. So let's get hold of the command and say get signers. So that's a list of public keys, as you can see. Um, and I need to make sure that these list of keys that I'm getting does contain the public key of my issuer. So I can get the issuer from the token state itself and like I said, the issuer uh, is a party, which is an API from Corda. And if you go inside that class, you have a function which gives you the public key of that party, which is get owning key. And that should test that whether the issuer is basically your signer or not. If he is not, so that's putting a not statement there. We can throw an exception saying illegal argument exception and say issuer signature required, right? That's pretty much it. Um, so that's how your commands are written. You can pretty much write uh, like business validations, look at what your outputs are, what you really expect it to come. Um, so this is a simple one just to make life easier for ourselves while we're developing our very first application. But yeah, you could write any kind of uh, business validation rules that you want to put in here. But let's just make sure that uh, whatever we have written is absolutely perfect. I'll just uncomment the entire test case and try to run it all at once and see how it goes. All right, so it's running. Now, um, while it runs, I just want to show you one test case and try and understand what exactly is happening here. So you can see that uh, it's a little different from uh, our general JUnit test cases. That's because we're using the contract PSL, which is uh, our own um, language for testing this particular uh, contract. If you if you understand to, to, to really test a contract, you need to simulate a transaction, which cannot be done without some mocking, right? So that's where what we are doing is we're creating a transaction using this transaction block. Um, and then uh, we're passing some mock services to it. And after that, all we do is uh, to this transaction object, we add inputs, outputs, commands, and then we have two statements, which one is one which says tx.fails, another which says tx.verifies. So tx.fails assumes that this transaction will fail and tx.verifies assumes that this transaction would pass, right? So if you look at this entire test case, what we're doing is we're running two transactions. One we assume should fail, one we assume should pass, and why? Uh, because this transact, this particular test case is trying to test that our uh, our our our, trans our, uh, our transaction does not have an input. So here, when we assume that it should fail, we are really putting an input and assuming that it should fail. So that's a negative testing that we're doing. And here, uh, we're not putting an input, so we assume that it should pass. That's a positive testing. So this is how we do our contract test. We create different transactions, and then we assume that some of them should pass and some of them should fail. So as you can see, all of our test cases have passed. Well, uh, you can see exceptions here. You might say that something has gone wrong, but that's not actually the case. 
Uh, these exceptions are because of the negative testing that we are doing, uh, like something here. We have thrown an exception from the code, which means that will be shown over here. You can see the message here, one output expected, which is basically what we have written as a message in our contract code. So that's what we're getting here. So all good. Uh, all our contracts have passed, uh, our contract test cases have passed. So that means the contract has been developed successfully. So that's done. Um, our state is done. Our uh, contract is done. So the final thing that we are worried about right now is the flow, right? Now that should, uh, once we develop our flow, uh, we should bring everything together. We, we would have a working simple code app with us. Well, let's go ahead and do that. Well, the flow, uh, some part of it is already written. As you can see, that's because it's, it's more like a template code. It's being done over and over again. So I just did not want to show you all the code and, uh, and try to frighten you. I just want to, I'll, I'll basically run over this and so uh, show you what we are really doing. Um, the, the flow has a uh, constructor uh, with certain parameters. So these are the parameters which will be passed on to the flow while we try to run the flow. So these are like, uh, uh, so this is an issue flow, right? So we want the owner and the amount to be flexible. We don't want uh, them to be hard coded on the, on the, on the, on the flow itself so that uh, you can't change them. So as a initiator or as a node who is issuing this particular token, he has the flexibility to define who the owner and the amount is. So using the same flow, he can basically have any amount and any owner that he wants. So that's taken as parameters. Going forward, we have a progress tracker, uh, which will basically give you, uh, give you sentence statements around where your current flow is. You can put that. So we haven't implemented that here, but uh, that, that's there to help you with understanding where your flow is at this point of time. Um, so coming back or coming into the call method, this is where the main things happen. Well, call is where your, where your, your, where your flow execution starts. The first thing we need is for our transaction, we need a notary. So we can get hold of the notary using the service hub. A service hub is a particular, um, um, is, is a particular object which gives you access to different node services. And one of them is your network map to which you can get hold of the notary. Now, there is a convenient method to get your own identity, which is the identity of the node that is really running this particular flow. And you can use that to get your own identity. And any, ident any, any node who is basically running this flow is actually the issuer. He's trying to issue something to someone. So he's the issuer. Uh, the owner, we're getting it from the parameter itself. The amount, we're getting it from the parameter itself. So all that we need to create a token here, we have all of them. So let's create the token state, right? We have the issuer, which we got from the get our identity owner and the amount is passed by whoever is running this flow. So that should be our output state, right? Mm -hmm. Is there something wrong? Okay. Why do I see? Anyways, let's move on and see if it gives us any error later on. But yeah, so that's our token. Um, so next thing that we want to do is build our transaction. We have our output here. The next thing we want to do is build the transaction. To build a transaction, we have something called as a transaction builder, um, which we can use. And this transaction builder will take the notary as a parameter in its constructor and it will allow you to add input and output states. So even if you have input states, you can use the add input states, but uh, like we are uh, doing an issuance, we do not have an input state. So just say get add output state and add your output just you, which, is, which you just created. And what else your transaction need? It's a command that it needs to identify the intent, right? So I say, what is the command for me? It's the issue command. And finally, I need to pass in the list of signers or the public keys who should sign this transaction. So who is that? It's the issuer, it's issuer's public key. And let's also pass the owner's public key because we want to also see how the collect signature happens. So it's not required in your contract, but we can anyways collect signatures even if it's not required in the contract. So let's do that. That's pretty much it. You build your transaction. And uh, what's happening after that is we're very, once we build our transaction, uh, if you remember how the flows work, what we do is we, once you propose the transaction, you're going to verify the transaction and then you're going to sign the transaction and then you're going to collect signatures and finally notarize and record, right? So that's what is happening. So these are the APIs which you would call to do those things. 
First thing is verify or run your contract. So that's done using the transaction builder dot verify method. And then the next thing is to sign your transaction. So that's done here. And finally, collect signatures flow. Before, before you collect signature, you need to actually establish a session or a flow session with your counterparty, which can be done using this particular API method called initiate flow. And that will give you a flow session, which you can pass to the collect signatures flow. And that will take care of collecting signatures from your counterpart. Obviously, you need to write something on the responder part. But uh, yeah, we'll go to that later on. And once you have collected the signature, you just, you just need to call the finality flow, which will take care of everything. Like, sending it to the notary, getting it notarized, and then um, recording it onto the ledgers as well. So nothing to worry, just call these inbuilt flows and it will do it for you. Now moving to the responder and seeing what we really have here. The responder is pretty lightweight, not much. It's just doing two things, right? One is it is signing the transaction when it's receiving it uh, from, the, from the counterpart. Uh, and the other thing is it is just recording your transaction once it has been notarized. So these are the two things which will be done here. The first thing is sign transaction flow. So whenever you collect signatures flow is called, the flow will uh, transfer control to here, which is the signed transaction flow. And it will take care of the entire process of like checking for uh, checking the transaction against your contract. And if everything goes well, it will also sign the transaction and send it back to the initiator. What you see here is an extra method which says check transaction. Now this is particularly useful when you have situations as in um, say you have a particular case, even taking the example of this particular case, the contract validation, which is a global validation for this uh, token state says that positive, it should have a positive amount. Anything, any token will be accepted if it has a positive amount. Now, for example, this particular guy who is, uh, who is, who is accepting any tokens, he wants to say, I don't accept tokens less than hundred or less than thousand. So how do we put that kind of validations? That's where this particular block comes in. So if you have any, uh, personal rules that you want to put in and it's not part of your global contract rules that's where you can put your rules over here and that will be checked while your transaction is done but that's not global that's only for you all right so that's about the signing part and uh, collect signatures part and then finally once uh, uh, you, the, your entire thing would have been done uh, you would have your receive finality flow which will be uh, just going ahead and recording your transaction on the ledger. That's it. Yeah, hey, Ashutosh, sorry, I'm back. Ah, no <laughs> Time for some quiz. Really? Let's do this. Yes. Okay, I hate interrupting, but I love quizzes. No worries. Great. Uh, so everyone, let's get on the quiz. This is the fifth quiz we are doing, and this is for $150. Okay, and yeah, so let me share my screen. You can join with the same link, but still I'm sharing it on Zoom. So if you can see on Zoom, I'm sharing the link. So there are two. Yes, so we'll make it quick. Uh, maybe maybe one more minute before we start. So everyone go to slider.com and enter your name, email address, correct name, correct, correct email address. And if you're using mobile phone, you can also scan the QR code. So let's make it quickly here. Okay, come on everyone, we got, yeah. Oh, great. So a lot of people are joining. We are still waiting. If you want to enjoy this game, if you want to win $150, please join. And the question will be a bit difficult from yesterday. Uh, not exactly difficult, but different. Let's see if you can answer that. So day by day, we will, we'll, we'll, we will be going into more technical stuff. I can see a lot of people have joined. How many of you are there? Okay, good amount. So 10 more seconds, five seconds. Great, so let's get started. I hope you are all set for the first question. And here we go. The first question, 
which is the latest java version is it 11 13 16 or 17 i know we have 10 seconds but we'll make it quickly in next five seconds and here we go three two one and most of you have answered java 17 and let's see the answer and that is correct september we got java 17 awesome let's move towards the next question which is the fifth layer of osi model i know we are going back to the engineering college uh, so is it presentation layer session layer network layer or transport layer come on i know you're counting now i will just quickly go for three two one and let's see the options okay so most of you are oh there's a confusion between session layer and network layer let's see the right answer that's a session layer network i guess is three right oh yeah but yeah anyway we got a good number now, after these two questions, it's time to see the leaderboard. And here we go. We got Alexi on top. Awesome. We got Luca, Karthik. Great. So we got some new audience today in the leaderboard. Yes. And that's also important, not just about the questions. Uh, of course, most of you have got the right answer, but for, for both, the timing is very important. You have to be as quick as possible. Maybe the moment you see the question, just answer it if you know the answer. Okay, let's move to the next question. Which is the primary programming language for the Android development? Is it C Sharp, Swift, Perl, or Kotlin? Come on, three more seconds. Three, two, one. And oh, great. Most of you have answered Kotlin. Is it right? Yes, it's Kotlin. So you have Java and Kotlin both, but yeah, let's, you're doing well there. Next one. Yes. Who created the G GNU project in 1983? Is it? You can see the options there. Come on for $150. Be quick. Ending in two seconds. And time up. Let's see the options. Oh, okay. Most of you are saying Richard Stallman. That's, let's see the right answer. And that's correct. It's Richard Stallman. You know, uh, after this thing, go to Google and search for the full form of GNU. It's quite fun. Okay, and last question, come on, $150, be quick. Bit difficult, yeah. So Dash is the tool for defining uh, defining and running multi-container Docker application. Oh, difficult one. You can see the options. I will give you full three seconds here. And let's see what, yes, and let's see. Oh, most of you are saying Docker Composer. That means you have working on Docker. That's great, Docker Com Composer. Oh, five questions. Okay, and let's see the leaderboard. Oh, Alexei, you are on top. Congratulations. So Alexei, will, you will receive a mass mail from our side and uh, congratulations. And you can see R on the second. I got a message from Ada as well on the Hubilo platform. His name is Richard. Uh, so we got Alexei on top. Congratulations, and you will receive the mail soon. So that's from the quiz. So Ashutosh, how, how many you were able to answer? Well, uh, I, I wasn't even playing, but obviously I wouldn't have won. <laughs> <laughs> Too difficult to answer. Come on, you are you are a geek. I know you know all the all the answers. All yours, Ashutosh. Uh, yeah, um, thank you so much. Congratulations, Alexi, for the hundred and fifty dollars. Ah, that was fun, right? Let's have some more fun with our code then. Okay, going back to screen share. Perfect. All right. So I guess we're done with the code. Actually, we have built our first, very first code app. So that should be it. Um, we should, we are ready to deploy this and try and see how this works. Right. So how do we deploy this? Um, so to deploy, um, if you understand Coda is a network application right? you need multiple nodes running. So you need multiple systems probably, or probably you can run multiple nodes on your own system, but the entire setup could be a little difficult if you're thinking of production grade setup. Um, let's not do that. Let's think of something which is like something for developers, right? Something which can be done locally. So for that, we have a bootstrap network or a test network, which you can deploy and test out your applications. And how do we do that? We have certain Gradle commands that will help you do that. And if you go to build.gradle down here, you see a task called deploy nodes. And if you look closely into that, there are a few blocks of code which says nodes and they define certain nodes for you. So you can define different nodes using this deploy nodes command. And once you run that, 
you will have all the artifacts required to run these particular nodes on your system. So you define the name of the node, you, you define, uh, so this particular node is a notary. So you have the notary block. And uh, if you come down here, you see this is not a notary. So if you have a notary block, you define what kind of notary it is. Is it a validating, non-validating notary? What's the P2P port? What are the code apps that are getting deployed? A notary will naturally not have any code apps because it's just validating transactions in terms of uh, uniqueness or checking for double spend. So it does not need the code app itself. And there are a few more settings like the RPC settings, which will be used to log in to the node, right? Um, and uh, we haven't put any users to log into the node, node for the notary node, because obviously we don't want to log into the notary node. There isn't uh, much that we want to do there. You cannot run any transactions, but if you want to have a user just to check out how the node is doing like health and stuff, you can have put that put that particular user in there. But for the case of our demo, just for testing it out, we don't need, really need to do that. But for a real node where we really want to, or a transacting node, uh, where we really want to log in and fire transactions and see how our uh, transactions are recorded, for that we need users. So we are putting some users here with the help of this RPC users uh, block, which will allow you to have users and certain permissions that you want to give them. So that's our uh, deploy nodes configurations. And uh, let's move ahead to our terminal and try to run our deploy nodes command. So to do that, I'll just say gradle w clean deploy. Oh, shoot. that's wrong. Deploy nodes. All right, so that will run in a couple of minutes. And what it will do is it will create a build folder for you. And within the build folder, you have a nodes folder. If you look at this, um, the nodes folder has already been created. And you see all the nodes that we defined, uh, you have separate folders for each one of them and all the artifacts as in uh, whatever it needs, like the signing keys, the, the logs folder, and then your network map cache and all those things will get created within the within each and every um, directory that we have here. So I'll show you what all these things are once we have this entire process done, and uh, that will that will basically be enough to run a particular node like a dummy node for you in your uh, in your in your local environment and try to test out your your core apps. So this is successful, which means we should have everything we need. There you go. All right, so uh, you have your certificates, like I said, uh, for the node, which it will require, which it will require to sign transactions. You have the code apps folder, which is basically just building this entire application and putting it into that directory. You have the drivers directory, where if you need any kind of drivers, as in um, things like uh, any monitoring tool you're using, or you're using a different database like Oracle, you might need the JDBC drivers, so you can put it all here. So just for your information, by default, we're using the H2 database, but you can use any other database like Postgres, or um, if you're on enterprise, you could also use Oracle and other uh, enterprise level databases as well. So that's where the driver, driver directory is coming to play. Logs is pretty self-explanatory. It's a logs for your application or for your uh, Coda node. And then Coda.jar is the actual platform, this is where the entire Quota uh, code resides. So this is the jar which runs when you say I'm running the node. And then you have network parameters. Well, there's something like global parameters for your network as in what 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 uh, particular uh, version of Quota that you want to run on the network and, and all those kind of things, which is global to the entire network would be residing over here. And then you have the node configurations, which is uh, basically just taking all this information that you have put in your deploy nodes uh, command or your deploy nodes configuration and putting it as a node config. And you can just open it and see what we have. It says your legal name, your P2P addresses, your RPC addresses, and then certain security block, which defines your users and stuff. Uh, that's it. And then finally, you have your uh, persistence MV files, which is nothing but your S2 database, right? So that's all the artifacts that you would need. If you look down here, you have a run node script, right? So there's a uh, bad script for, for Windows and there is a shell script for uh, Linux and Mac. So for us, we can use the run nodes uh, script. And what that would do is basically, uh, it would run four nodes for you 
or whatever, how many nodes as uh, that you have here. So for us, it's four. There's a party A, party B, party C, and the notary. And that will do uh, run the nodes for you. And the way that you do that is just say, just go to build nodes. And over here, you have the run nodes script, which you can just run. Cool. Once you do that, you would have four nodes. Okay. Um, for some reason, the nodes are not starting. So what I'll do is I'll, as an alternative, I'll, I'll use a certain tool to run these nodes, but A. Just a second. Oh, it looks like something is going on with my system. So uh, can I bring up Peter and if he has the setup done, uh, he would be able to show this running code to you guys. Yes. <clears throat> so, hi, uh, I, I was running the chat and there actually, there were quite a uh, few questions in the chat, but we will get through the questions uh, uh, later. But right now, let me share my screen and actually I will uh, continue what Ashash left um, with the running the applications. So let me go to my desktop, bootcamp, and zoom in a little bit. And also let me bring out IntelliJ. To show you the code, so I I I have a exactly same copy of the code that Asha just wrote, um, and all uh you can you can see that from the system wise we have the same token state contract and uh, the flow initiator, and I also pass all the tests. So let me just head to the terminal and then run the applications. And you see right now on my screen that I'm popping up um, three terminals. Oh, uh, all right, I need to shut down. I'm in the wrong Java versions. Uh. Yes, so that's actually something that you should also check when you are following the sessions um, because, um, because Java, uh, because quarter four is running on Java 11 and with um, quarter five, we are now in Java 11. So we need to actually change our environment back to Java 8. So now if I check my versions, I'm on 1.8. And right now, let me just run my system again. Before we do that, we kill all the Java's to have a clean start. And we can now, uh, let me just uh, rebuild everything. So that will clean up the folders that I had here and actually recompile them into the uh, the new nodes. So Ashash was doing that, uh, but I think now I'm uh, doing that again to just to let everybody see that we have a, a clean environment to work with. And right now you can see on my screen that we have party A, party B, and party C, and there's a notary. Um, we are gonna run a very simple token insurance between party A and party B, uh, and that will, um, show in the terminal and we will 
also bring out party C to show you that since, since the transaction is peer, uh, peer to peer, is point to point, party C is not gonna get any notifications or broadcast to um, in its database. So that's, you know, if you were here with the session with us yesterday in the quarter one once, Ashash said, um, Quarter runs uh, a direct um, messaging system between one another. So even though they are in the same network, they will not get a broadcast. So um, uh, and you actually gonna see it uh, in front of uh, your eyes today. Uh, and please bear with us for um, the code is compiling. Uh, it's not actually this slow because you know we are running a Zoom sessions or webinars uh, our cpu is uh, sort of uh, divided into different um, functionalities and also at the same time i have docker running stuff like that <laughs> uh, so let me actually uh, Going back to some of the questions, I guess I can I can use the time uh, time right now. Yeah, you could if you while you're compiling, Peter. Yeah. If you want me to bring up Ashutosh, you guys want to answer some questions? That'd be great. Uh yes. Uh oh, it's just done. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay what the time? Uh, we'll bring them up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me actually run it right now. So again, um, that was actually one of the questions people were asking. Oh, where's the code? How do we run it? So. Uh, I share the links in the chat multiple times, um, multiple times, and uh, the link is uh, the link is GitHub slash Quora slash Bootcamp Quora, and all the instruction is in there. I also got people ask me, uh, oh, what's the uh, environment environment setups? I also share the link in the chat, so you can find all of them in the chat. Um, and right now, I comp uh, successfully compiled the project. Uh, it says build successfully, and I'm gonna hit the next command, which gonna run uh, the environment, uh, uh, run the network up. So hit enter. I'm gonna start seeing windows popping, and you don't see that endless error message because now we are in the correct Java versions, you know, Java 1.8. Um, and we see the quarter logo pop up, and we see that. Um, there are some like code jokes there. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna do the we're gonna do the laughing, uh, Peter, when you do the code jokes. So just let us. Uh, Mike's just about to press the code jokes. All right, Mike, go for it. <laughs> oh, they do the yay. <laughs> do the crickets <laughs> if you tell a code joke well, well let, let me let me just pick one of them so so like for example this one next to okay, the quarter okay, wait a minute are you gonna do the code joke go for it yeah yeah i'm gonna do the code joke so next to the quarter logo it says what did the fish say when he uh hit the wall damn right <laughs> so that's just one of them okay all right i guess enough for the code joke uh, and we can actually see that our node are all uh, start up, let me check, yes. So right now we are looking at a system with three node and one node tree. And again, you know, we got the people asking in yesterday's chat, you know, like what does a node tree mean? So it looks like node tree is no different than the other node, but technically they are only a service on the network. They do not have the capability to understand any core app, so you don't need to worry about any information uh, leaks. So right now, this one is a node tree, and we have party A here. You can see the party A, and we have party B here, and the party C. So let's run uh, um, a transaction between party A and the party B. So how we do that is we first, you know, right now you just, you know, console. You don't know anything, so we can first bring out the command by typing flow list. So the flow list will actually list out all the available flows that you just uh, wrote yourself. And the one that Ashash wrote is the token issue flow initiator. And the second one is the example that exists in the folders. So uh, actually, you know, as an example, you don't really need to worry about it. So what 
the commands that we're gonna initiate the flow is called flow star. And then we just paste in uh, the name of the flow. And right now you might ask yourself, uh, you might ask yourself, oh, uh, what about the parameters? I, I just developed my code, but I forget my parameters. So don't worry, you don't need to go between your terminal to IntelliJ back to your terminal, um, back and forth, you can just hit enter. Hit enter because uh, the terminal gonna tell you uh, what's your parameters was missing. So the constructor, the parameters of the constructor is missing, which is called owner and the amount but again you know we are doing a, a token issuance uh, a, a applications flow so we hit up and then we type our parameters owner and we want to initiate a transaction to party b so that's our first parameters the second one is among a m o u n t amount and let's uh, hit the lucky number let's say just 10 right and then we hit enter so it's generating the transaction and it, it looks you know, slow because it's the first time that we are sending a transaction to party B. If we hit again, uh, look before we hit again. So let's actually see that what does uh, party B has, right? You know, we send a transaction between party A, party B over a blockchain network or DLT network. We want to know that um, the counterparty actually uh, received uh, my message, right? So I go to the readme, back to my terminal, and then I paste in this code. So it says run vault query contract state type bootcamp.token state is literally word to word. So we are doing a uh, vault query. And if you were here for the sessions yesterday, um, Ashutosh was introducing that every node has a database basically called vault. So now what we are doing is we're looking into the database <coughs> of my particularly node, which is the party B node, and we want to do a query of what type of the bootcamp.token state type, which is what Asha just wrote. So I hit enter, I should see my state coming up, which is exactly what we um, just did here. So we have party A, the issuer is party B, a uh, party A, the owner is party B, and the amount is 10, which is exactly what we sent from party A to party B. Uh, and next, just to make sure that we are not really fooling ourselves, um, because we have three participants in the network. You know, Quarter is peer to peer, it's a direct messaging channel. We want to check if Party C really has any insight of what just happened, a transaction just fired between Party A and Party B. And let's see, we are actually have absolutely nothing in Party C's database. So that means all of our uh, things we were said about peer-to-peer -peer, um, blockchain DLT uh, are valid and you just uh, see it in, in front of your eyes. And again, you know, back to what I was mentioning earlier, I've said, oh, you might think um, the transaction between party A and party B is a little bit slow and then you are questioning about the TPS. So that's only going to happen when you first send the transaction because you are setting up the channels between different nodes. And if, for example, I, I send a different transaction, the transaction is going to be much faster and almost like immediate. And I just did it again and then you, you see it. So that's be, because the channels are already set up between party A and the party B for the first time, right? And then the second time or the any ongoing transaction between party A and party B, that will be much quicker and, and smoother. So uh, there you have it, uh, a transaction between party A, party B, and then party C has no idea about it. And oh, actually, let's before I hand it back to Ashutosh, one last thing I want to show the audience is uh, we got quite a lot of questions asking us, oh, what about the node tree um, sees everything? And right now, let me show you what does node tree sees. Node tree actually sees nothing because the database of the node tree doesn't even recognize uh, that tra um, the transaction or any information or any state from a core app because he, does, he just doesn't understand it. He doesn't operate it, uh, he doesn't operate like a node, he operate as a network service. He only, the node tree only recognize 
the hash of the transaction input. So uh, with that said, I think that will be our quick um, demo of the application that Oshash just developed. Uh, and I will actually hand it back to Oshash. Well, thank you so much, Peter. Well, uh, that's thanks for helping me out with that. I guess something went with, wrong with my system, but uh, pretty good to have you and show the completed code. Well, um, probably we're done with the session right now. We'll just uh, open it for some questions. So, uh, Peter, you had any interesting questions? Though I looked at the chat, um, I was able to answer some of them. Uh, there is one question which probably I might want to uh, put it and answer that directly the question says um, uh, so currently it, it's more about checking uh, asking whether uh, the businesses would really which is the node would really sign the transaction do we have any uh, any any way through which the end customers or the business could represent their end customers on the node and they could be able to sign well um, so the answer for that would be uh, till now what you have seen is all about the node which is your main identity and uh, that's the one which is signing the transaction but uh, we also have something called as accounts in Corda, which we'll be talking about tomorrow. And that allows you to represent your end users on the node. So that's also possible. And with accounts, you also need them to sign your transactions. So that's also there. So yeah, um, any more questions, Peter, moving back to you. So you have been on the chat for uh, longer than me. So probably you'll be able to tell me what our questions are there. And uh, so we do have a question asking why are we uh, verifying the output and the input uh, of the transaction inside of the contract uh, files. All right. So the reason we are doing that is your transaction is all about inputs and outputs, right? So you are pulling something out of your vault and then uh, updating that and creating an output. Now, say, for example, you uh, if you don't uh, basically validate this, now take an example of uh, cash, right? Uh, so how would you make sure that whatever is being transferred is actually uh, the real amount? So if you say, I want to transfer, say me as a node, I want to transfer $100 to Peter. And I, cre I create an input which uh, says I'm consuming $100 and I create an output which says I'm consuming $50. And if you don't really actually calculate that and uh, basically check what is happening within your inputs and outputs, Peter would only receive 50 while I would have consumed hundred or probably two so in, in which case I wouldn't really do that because I'm hurting myself. I might say I'm consuming hundred and I'm passing him thousand to Peter. So Peter would get thousand while I'm only consumed hundred from my wallet, which means I spent hundred from my wallet and I gave Peter without even spending the rest of the 900. So I am being profitable at this point of time. So this is something the content validation is really important. That's done on the contract level. That's what keep your entire system or, or keeps the integrity of the system good enough intact. So that's where your validations are really important. Your contract has to be written in a great way. Uh, any other questions, Peter? Or should we just pass it on to Naveen then? Yeah, I think that's actually yes. most of the questions in the chat, yes. Cool then, back to you, Naveen. Great, so they can also do the questions uh, in the office hours. They can ask you questions and uh, you can answer them. So it was a great session, uh, Ashutosh. You know, finally we have seen the code and it feels better. The moment you see, uh, you know, when you move from PPTs to code, so suddenly you feel better looking at the code. So that was awesome session, Astros, and uh, yeah. it was a good run through uh, to Thank the steps. And I'm All sure right. the participants will be drawing out the code by themselves after this session. Yeah, definitely. We would have so shared the all the links for them, which would help them to try it out. Awesome. Thank you so much, Astros. Great, now it's time for a break. So this is 11.15, uh, we can go for a break for 15 minutes. And during this break, we have this amazing magician, Mark, who is all set to show you some new tricks today. So Mark, you're all set. Thanks, Naveen. Yeah, I am indeed. Hello again. Please everyone give me a nice double-handed wave if you can see and hear me again. Excellent stuff. Great.